it is a great pleasure to see so many colleagues and students from the Graduate School of Education, as well as from other departments and academic uh, and administrative colleagues from uh, academic and administrative units at, AB, at UB. So a very warm welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm also pleased to welcome school leaders from the Buffalo schools and the region and today's lecture to launch our series titled The Pre-K-20 Educational Pipeline, Research, Policy, Practice and, Research, and, and, and Preparation. This idea emerged out of the many conversations we held in the Department of Leadership and Policy and has motivated our initiative to better articulate the intellectual issues as well as the pragmatic challenges that center around student transitions across educational systems and the need for a greater alignment of them. The key questions that we ask in our series are how do we prepare tomorrow's professionals, researchers, policymakers, and school leaders and rethink our curricula to deliver education along the P20 pipeline? What are the critical issues that shape education in the 21st century and specifically how can P20 education and research agendas advance them? How do we ensure educational opportunities for all students and strengthen countries' global footing and competitiveness? I'm very pleased that Dr. Scott Thomas has agreed to open this series with a talk that perfectly fits our theme, Markets, Mission and the Public Good the future of higher education through equity in primary and secondary schooling. Dr. Scott Thomas is Professor of Higher Education and the Dean of the School of Educational Studies at Claremont University, one of the top graduate schools in the United States, a position he has held since 2012. As a professor, he teaches higher education policy, the sociology of higher education, and research methods in the Claremont Graduate University, and he is the co-director of the Bowen Institute for Policy Studies in Higher <coughs> Education. Dr. Thomas earned his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and has held faculty positions at the University of Georgia, the University of Arizona, and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. In Hawaii, he served as the founding director of the Hawaii's Educational Policy Center. Since 2011, Scott has, has been serving a five-year term as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Higher Education, the oldest higher educational journal in the world and one of the most prestigious educational journals in the United States. He's also co-editor of the book series International Studies in Higher Education. Scott's research focuses on student success, addresses issues of equity of educational opportunity, and connects issues in K-12 and higher education. His work looks at pathways and transitions to college and how financial cost affects degree attainment. His earlier work examines the variance in economic outcomes and indebtedness related to college work and student field choice. He's a prolific scholar and a skillful methodologist. His writing on methodological topics ranges from linear modeling, to sampling theory, to social network analysis. This work can be found in numerous journal articles, books, and book chapters. I'm delighted that he was able to accept our invitation and visit with us. Please join me in welcoming Scott. Thank you all. I, it's sort of like being at your wake. I don't know. <laughs> Do I play the role of the corpse here? <laughs> thank you for coming out this afternoon. Um, and thank you for the, for the gracious introduction and for making this possible. Uh, when, when the invitation was extended, um, I just had to say yes. Uh, I've, I've had uh, dear colleagues, uh, friends in this program, in, in this, the, the college and in various programs for years. And it's an honor to come to Buffalo and, uh, and be able to share with you uh, some of my thinking about uh, one of the topics that has really uh, rooted my passion uh, in education over the last decade in particular. Um, a, uh, 
morning for those of you that came to hear about statistical modeling and sampling uh, design and this kind of stuff. Uh, you'll hear none of it today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody left. <laughs> okay. I could have cleared out half the room had I made the warning the other direction. Um, I'm going to take on a topic today uh, that um, really is, is, is a culmination of, of my thinking about how we've framed uh, education generally, higher education in particular, uh, over the last 30 years. And I'm going to start with the, the problem. And it may not be the problem that you came here to listen to me talk about, but I hope that I'll eventually be able to tie this problem to our problem collectively. And here's the problem, and this problem actually is the problem of, of the moment because this was published on September 18th in Inside Higher Education. Uh, Inside Higher Ed is uh, one of the two uh, higher education uh, newspapers. Uh, online only, and uh, Inside Higher Ed occasionally does uh, very in-depth surveys of different populations, and they just released the College and University Admissions Director Survey, and you'll find this online uh, at Inside Higher Ed if you're interested in that. Uh, but I bring this forward as the problem, the straw dog, if you will, that I'll shoot at here. Um, here's the summary, or here's the opening of the story that then links to the report. Last year was a difficult one for college admissions, with institutions reporting more and more difficulty filling their classes. Things aren't any better, and they may be a little worse according to the 2014 Inside Higher Education Survey of College and University Admissions Directors. Slightly fewer colleges reported meeting their enrollment targets by May 1, more reported anxiety about meeting their targets, and more reported recruiting those who had already committed to other institutions. While the increases in all areas were small, Last year's totals were large and worrisome to many college leaders. Okay, so these these guys are suggesting that we're having trouble filling our class. Well, they're telling us we're having trouble filling our classes. There's no suggestion here. Uh, this suggests a, a, a pipeline problem of sorts that uh, we might want to uh, pay attention to. Uh, the solution for these problems, uh, if you go on to read the story and, and read the report, uh, are things that are well known to us. Uh, Public and private institutions are behaving differently. Uh, public institutions are going after um, out-of-state students, going after international students, and uh, really keeping a focus on quality of their in-state students. This is a, a, a generalized behavior. There are exceptions to this, but I'm just painting a, a broad pattern here. Private institutions uh, are, um, they want full-time students too. They want full-time, full-paying students to attend private institutions. The finances of private institutions are, are, are quite different. Um, and uh, their full pay could be full pay with loans or full pay with some other form of financing, but the point is that they want students that they don't have to discount their prices uh, overly in order to enroll. Uh, both types of institutions uh, at the four-year level, this is true also at the two-year level, interestingly. Both types of institutions at the four-year level, which I'm going to focus on by and large today, um, are experiencing the same pressure to find enrollable students who can come and pay money at the institutions and support the budgets of those institutions. I get to the budget part of that because that's really not the problem that I'm totally interested in here. Uh, but it is the problem that seems to have our attention collectively at the moment that, you know, we're having a finance problem in higher education. Anybody not aware of that? Yeah? Big finance problem. Uh, a big component of these finances uh, is tuition revenue. Uh, and uh, by golly, even at uh, a fine research institution like the University of Buffalo, uh, tuition revenue makes up a giant proportion of the revenues of the institution. And any variation in that revenue uh, has deep consequences for uh, programs, for staff, for faculty, and for student success. So this is why we focus on the problem nationally. Now I contend that if we um, are going to uh, understand the nature of the problem, if you can understand my argument about the, the form of the problem, uh, we need to understand a little bit about the history of higher education uh, in America. And I'm not going to go back and sort of start 1636, Harvard came, and we, we won't do that, okay? Uh, but what I do want to start with is an important period um, in the 20th century. And that's when the game of mass higher education really came into being. Uh, but before I get there, can anyone tell me where these four pictures are? Berkeley, 
Okay, good. Californian in the audience. Excellent. Sproul Plaza, right? Sproul. Sproul, excuse me. I'm Santa Barbara. What do I know? <laughs> Swarthmore. Okay. Yale. Pomona College, where I'm from. Okay, why do I have these fine institutions up here? Because when we think of college, we often think of, or this is the image that we like to convey when we're trying to seduce young people and their parents. Uh, to pay the money that's necessary to enroll in this uh, thing that we know as college. So we have this idea about what higher education is today, and the idea doesn't necessarily map on to the varied realities of this. So, so let's go back in time and think a little bit about uh, how we got to, to where we are. Um, the golden era of higher education. Anybody remember, remember this? Good. <laughs> I, I saw a hand almost come up back there. Uh, Post-World War II. Uh, GIs returning from um, the war, uh, there was deep concern about uh, massive unemployment, the exacerbation of an already uh, problematic unemployment situation in the U.S. Uh, there were a couple of key moments uh, after World War II. Uh, one was the Truman Commission that dealt with uh, really set the beginnings for civil rights that would uh, civil rights legislation. The, move, the movement would, would begin in earnest uh, shortly after the Truman Commission. Uh, and uh, I'll come back to that uh, in about 30 years, um, actually about 20 years. Uh, but the other piece was the GI Bill, and the GI Bill was a solution to the vets' return home, and it was uh, a very pragmatic, uh, I won't say on the fly solution, but it was an expedient solution to a problem of unemployment. And what we would do is we would divert the returning GIs uh, to colleges and universities. And that would keep them. That would keep uh, the the labor market from uh, having to absorb uh, this large uh, wave of GIs returning. Um, and it would also, presumably, a byproduct of that is it would promote the development of human capital that would in turn fuel the economy. And you don't have. To, I'm not an economist. I'm a sociologist, so I don't really know what I'm talking about uh, in, in this front. But uh, the point is that this this solution met a lot of needs uh, nationally, and the thing worked marvelously, and we had uh, uh, vets uh, turning to college campuses in droves. In fact, we learned very quickly before the end of the 40s, Mark, you're teaching history of higher education, right? Okay, mm -hmm. you, you check me if I'm, I'm making stuff up here. Um, <laughs> by the end of the 40s, we realized we did not have the capacity, and capacity is an important idea here, we did not have the capacity, the infrastructure, to accommodate the demand that was placed on enrollment in college and university. So it was, in some ways, the opposite, if you just look at demand and supply, it was the opposite situation to the one that is characterized in, inside higher education today. Um, great, so what did we do? We doubled down on this. We had to build campuses. We built great campuses. We expanded uh, uh, fledgling campuses. Um, enrollments soared across the uh, 40s. Uh, and by the time we got into the 50s, uh, a couple of things happened. One, in the 50s, the, the, the civil rights movement started in earnest. Remember I mentioned the Truman Commission idea? The Truman Commission came together and really talked about equity in society in ways that no one had ever, ever faced it. And it dealt with the role of education in equity and race relations and in, in, in income uh, disparities and the role that those uh, tensions were playing in inhibiting growth of, America, of, of the United States. Um, so we have that going on with a, a, a nascent civil rights movement happening, but we also have this, this, this truly, arguably one of the, uh, the, the key global event uh, for the United States in, in the 20th century, uh, the space race, and we have a Cold War challenge here. Um, we have uh, uh, nuclear weapons um, that uh, are coming into play. We have uh, Europe that is uh, reorganizing itself in ways that are threatening to the U.S. Uh, you see I have newspaper clippings from uh, uh, something that was uh, very emblematic of this, and, and this was uh, the space race with the uh, Soviet Union. Um, and in the space race, uh, you know, we, we thought that with the development, with the human capital development, with the scientific development that we were investing in, uh, that this was something we were going to be out ahead of. Don't forget that in World War II, we led the charge with uh, the development of atomic weaponry. Uh, so we, we had pride in our scientific stance globally. Uh, we thought that with the investments that we were making after World War II, this was something that we could, that the space race itself was something we could participate in meaningfully, but lo and behold, before we knew it, Russia, the uh, Soviet Union, excuse me, had, uh, had launched a satellite uh, into space uh, that was visible uh, to the naked 
uh, Americans. This was this was a, 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 an important moment in that it was a galvanizing moment from a policy perspective and from uh, 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 from, from from a political uh, uh, point. So we have uh, uh, John Kennedy here committing us uh, to um, winning the Cold War, committing us to winning the space race, and making the bold proposition that we would put a man on the moon, uh, heck with a satellite, we're going to put a man on the moon, we are the United States, uh, by, when, what was the date that he used? Well, I'm not going to look at Margaret. 1969. Mm -hmm. 69, okay. And, and we actually beat the date, it turns out. But um, uh, what this is, it, it, it's a signal moment and a commitment around a singular goal that is we're going to acquire massive investments in human capital and scientific development. Uh, to achieve. And we already have stuck, begun laying the framework for this through the GI Bill and through the development of campuses in the post-World War II period. So we have the infrastructure, we have the infrastructure coming up to speed. We have the talent. Uh, it's now just the resources and the will to do this. And I would suggest to you that this was a signal moment in uh, what we might think of as the nation-building stance of education in America. So we treated education as a core vehicle for achieving this rather bold goal of putting a human being on the moon uh, by the end of, uh, of the 60s. Um, and from this perspective, I want you to think about education, higher education in particular in, in this instance, uh, as a public good. It's fundamentally a public good. And um, uh, when, I, when I was introduced, it was mentioned that um, I co-direct the Howard Bowen uh, uh, Center for uh, Public Policy and Higher Education. Uh, Howard Bowen uh, was an economist. Uh, he was president of Claremont Graduate University. He was president of Grinnell. He was president of the University of Iowa. He wrote uh, widely about uh, the social value of higher education from an economic perspective. And at Claremont Graduate University, where I'm from, uh, we have the Drucker School of Business, and Peter Drucker uh, also wrote about uh, the social responsibility of the corporation. And these two came together to uh, give a lot of thought to what it means for institutions of education uh, to be part of the public good rather than considered solely as a private good. And so I'm suggesting to you that this is a moment in which uh, we were at a high point of education being understood broadly as a public good. This is a good time. The results of that were significant. If this works, you'll see what happens with baccalaureate degree attainment. Ah, oh, it works. Okay. So over here, you can't read this uh, in the back, I'm sure, but uh, the the dark red it will it will go all red there is less than 10% uh, of the population by age 25 with a bachelor's degree or more by decade. So uh, we have 1950 down here. That's 1960. We have 10 to 20. Uh, yellow is going to be 20 to 30, the light green is going to be 30 to 35, and the dark green is going to be more than 35% of the population, uh, age 25 plus, with a bachelor's degree. So the investment that we made in terms of training people and credentialing them, we're talking about credentials here, not necessarily the content of the training, but credentialing people uh, definitely can be demonstrated uh, through a, a simple glance at, at degree attainment over the period. Um, and this is carrying us uh, uh, well up to, to the current time. Um, but in the 70s, uh, well, a couple of things happened. Uh, late 60s, uh, let's go back, mid 60s, we had really the culmination of the Civil Rights Movement, and that resulted in the Civil Rights Act. Uh, same time we had the Higher Education Act, which wasn't coincidentally timed with the Civil Rights Act. There were things that overlap in those two acts. Um, and so we had come to uh, sort of the, the race, race relations uh, manifest in, in the movement uh, came to a head and were, uh, I think you, if you could think about the, the, the legislation that was enacted as being a, a formal capstone to the activity that occurred over the previous decade. Um, at the same time, so there's tension, and okay? there's racial tension in the country. At the same time, uh, we're in a war, and we're in a war in Vietnam. And this is a uh, very unpopular war. It's a polarizing war. Um, and uh, colleges and universities played an important role 
and uh, the political playing out, if you will, uh, of our reaction to that war. College campuses were a haven uh, for uh, young men who were uh, not interested in being drafted. We had a very active draft in one place that you could avoid the draft uh, to some extent uh, was on college campuses. Uh, college campuses were also, uh, the summer of love was somewhere in there too, so they're, they're, I, and I, I cite that because this is a time of free thinking, this is a time where you can hear slogans, uh, I think I saw a sign to this effect in Colorado yesterday, uh, dissent is patriotism, okay? Uh, where uh, dissent was understood as being, it was, it was our duty as citizens to dissent from the public. This is quite different rhetoric than you hear today. Uh, dissent is patriotic, okay? So college campuses were a haven, they were a protected zone. They remain that today for this type of speech, this type of thinking, and this type of activity. Um, when you think about the, now put yourself in your, 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 uh, your representative uh, in Washington, and your city, you've just passed the Higher Education Act. Uh, we're coming up to the 1972 reauthorization of higher education, which is going to create a need-based aid system. It's going to specify a lot of very important, uh, a lot of very important and liberalizing changes to the way that we enable young people and, and, and more advanced people uh, to attend college, colleges and universities. Uh, so you're spending a tremendous amount of money, and you just spent a whole pile of money on the space race thing, and then all of a sudden you have college campus becoming an incubator for dissension, an incubator for protest, against who? Against you in Washington, okay? So, so there are political challenges to the people who are making decisions about the way we fund this. Um, and uh, this cools enthusiasm for continued support and funding at the levels that had been committed to that point in time. We get to the 70s, and uh, we began seeing, well, there's Howard Bowen, investment and learning. That was uh, uh, part of the argument about this. We need to be thinking about campuses as the social good, not necessarily the private good, because legislators were now saying, well, what are we getting in exchange for this, okay? You know, are, are graduates really earning more? They begin asking these questions about return on investment from the individual level perspective. And we also have those questions fueled by something uh, represented by Richard Freeman's The Overeducated American. You know, we had a horrible economy in the mid-70s and we had a labor market surplus. And so uh, you start adding all this up, okay, we got protests on campuses, we're at war, we're out of money, uh, boils through the roof. Um, the people who are graduating from these places that we're investing all this money in can't get jobs. You know, what on earth's going on here? There, 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 there's a further cooling of commitment to uh, college campuses across the country. Uh, and on top of, this is Kent State, uh, from uh, 1970, May 4th, 1970, uh, where you know, protesters, Vietnam, the National Guard opens fire on them, kills several protesters. Uh, this was not a good period for higher education. Um, there is, at this point, a, I use the term cooling, a cooling of funding enthusiasm for post-secondary education. Um, as I move into this next slide, I want to uh, uh, give recognition to somebody, a man by the name of Tom Mortensen, who runs Post-Secondary Opportunity. And Tom works out of uh, this office in, I'm going to try to pronounce the name of a little town in Iowa. Uh, and he basically crunches numbers on patterns in higher education over time. And so some of the slides you're going to see come from, from a lot of Tom's work. But uh, this first slide uh, shows our funding patterns across this period. And I'm going to suggest to you that the economy and politics play an important part in, uh, in, in the pattern that we see here. And uh, I'll let you uh, sort this out to some degree. We have um, state and local governments here, students and parents here, uh, and federal government here. This is for higher education, not for K-12 education. I'm coming to the K-12 part. Didn't I promise you a pipeline mm -hmm. part? Okay, I'm coming to the K-12 part here. Uh, but you see a, 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 a notable shift in the way that we structure the financing for post-secondary education. I don't think that this is news to, to anybody uh, in, in the room. Um, the chart that you saw with the changes in proportions of people earning baccalaureate degrees uh, is informed by this next chart, which shows uh, exactly who has been earning those baccalaureate degrees over time. Uh, you can go back to 1970 here, and this is the top income quartile families, uh, third, second, first. 
And again, I don't think this is news to anybody, but I just want to make sure that we establish the, the, the facts in the case very clearly here, that if you come from uh, a less advantaged background economically, uh, your probabilities of earning a baccalaureate degree are uh, far lower than they are if you come from a more advantaged background. Um, now, this is, uh, I'm sorry, I, I lied to you here. This is just college going. Wrong slide, you'll see. Use what I just said about the next slide, okay? This is college going. I should have looked at the numbers over here. Almost 90% in 2010. It hasn't changed much in 2011, which are our latest numbers available from. About 90% of the upper income went, about two thirds of uh, st uh, students from lower income families went immediately after high school. This is just enrolling in college, okay? So a big disparity in terms of who gets to college. Um, let's look at attainment. Once you get to college, uh, what happens to you by income quartile? Well, about 10% of, I told you there were going to be no statistics here, and I know these are statistics, but roll with me here for a few minutes. 10% uh, of lower income families, 15% second quartile, you'll see a third of uh, third income quartile uh, families have their children uh, likely to attain a baccalaureate degree, and look at the top income group, I mean, just, just off the charts here. And you see some fluctuation over time. So again, deep disparities in terms of who's actually earning uh, a baccalaureate degree. Um, I'll stop here for a moment and just come back to uh, how I opened um, with the problem. Uh, you know, the problem is we're not a, we haven't we, we have vice presidents and admissions officers concerned about meeting the enrollment targets for their classes. And if they don't meet the enrollment targets for the classes, the budgets of universities and colleges are generally put in jeopardy to some greater or larger degree, depending on how far off things are. Uh, now, um, if you are in that office and you're thinking about tuition revenue, and you look at this, and you think about these lines of completion, I study student success. This is not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about institutional success, okay? Look at the lines of completion. If you look at the, if you just figure out the proportion of people who don't complete, who enter, and you turn that into a student FTE and you put a tuition value on it, you can figure out how much money you're losing by not graduating uh, students that you enroll in the institutions. Okay? Then we can get into the question of, well, why aren't they graduating? Well, it turns out that students in this income quartile have a very different set of challenges than students in that income quartile. Um, so let's look at uh, kind of the, the, the meat of this here. Um, Fun fact, actually it's not that fun of a fact. Do you know that over half of our K-12 enrollments qualify for free and reduced lunch? Over half. And I'm gonna show a slide in, in a bit that shows some estimates of, of what that trajectory is. That's one. The second fact is that over half of uh, post-secondary enrollments qualify for Pell Grant at some level. Okay. So we're dealing with populations uh, that are in economic need by the definition set forth with the federal government. Um, the proportion of Pell Grant recipients um, enrolling in uh, post-secondary education, you can see, uh, this is 46% by 2010. It actually goes to 52% by 2012. That's the over half that I was referring to. But you see a climb over time. Um, I said 72 was an important year. That was the inception of the Pell Grant. We see it come into play here. Now, Pell Grant receipt, you get the, 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 the Pell Grant reward, award, not reward, the Pell Grant award has not kept pace with the rate of tuition increase. So what the Pell Grant bought you back here is not what the Pell Grant buys you over here. That's an, an important point to remember. But you see Pell Grant, the shares of Pell Grant enrollees has been going up. Um, the uh, share of bachelor's degrees awarded to, this is what we saw on the other slide, to students from the bottom income quartile uh, remains fairly flat. So while we have more students from uh, low income backgrounds enrolling, we have no improvement in terms of the graduation rate for those students. Um, we get to the third line here in, in a moment, um, but let me note that the share of, an, of, of Pell grant eligible students enrolled at four-year schools has declined markedly over the last 10 years. Meaning that, meaning that 
four-year institutions, four-year public institutions in particular, um, are enrolling uh, fewer students from low-income backgrounds than they have historically. Back to some of the responses to the demand for, uh, for, for students to, to generate tuition revenue. Uh, that's also true in two-year schools, so we're seeing a decline in terms of the Pell Grant enrollment. Um, establishing that we have needy students in both K-12 and higher education by the proportions of students qualifying for free lunch and the proportions of students qualifying for Pell. Here's a line that shows you uh, the growth in students who are approved for free and reduced lunch uh, in the K-12 system over time. This is the pipeline that's coming at us here. And so I use this to suggest to you that uh, there's, there's a lot more of this to come, one, and two, that our institutions of higher education are not terribly well equipped to deal with the challenges that come with students graduating uh, from backgrounds of some poverty as is expressed by free and reduced lunch. A projection of where we're likely to be, where we're likely to be, there are three different uh, projections here. Um, so this goes out to 2030. Uh, this is what you saw in that third line arrayed in, in a bar graph here. So you see the increase in subsidized school lunches across time, nationally. Now if we take three projections, we take a projection that looks at this entire series uh, and projects it out here. If you look at the entire series, here's what we're likely, and this is just a linear projection. I promise you no fancy statistics, okay? So nothing adjusted for here, but if you just take a simple projection, this is what we're likely to expect if you look at the whole series. If you look at the series back to uh, 2000, you get this middle line. If you look at the series back to 2008, at the beginning of the recession, you get this line right here, C. Okay? But either way, the backgrounds of students that are going to be coming to post-secondary education are going to be increasingly from backgrounds of less affluence and greater poverty. And we know that those backgrounds are also correlated with a host of learning challenges, a host of health challenges, and a host of financial challenges that we have not been able to meet effectively uh, across time. If I come in back, back to the slide that I showed earlier with the uh, attainment, and you relate what I said to attainment, and you're thinking, again, I'm not an economist, but I read the New York Times, okay? Uh, I'm thinking, uh, okay, what, what are the likely scenarios if, if more and more of our college enrollments are coming from low-income backgrounds, and this, these lines here aren't moving that much? Uh, this would suggest that um, the human capital that we're developing uh, should be called into question, the degree of human capital we're developing, especially for an economy that is presumed uh, to require skills and knowledge uh, that's provided by a college experience of some kind. Um, I'm going to belabor the point for just a minute, and then I'm going to come back to thinking about uh, the so what and, and, and what this means for how we um, structure our K-12 schooling. Uh, this slide this simply shows the um, uh, changes in the attainment rate by income quartile over time. You see, if you're, you're from an upper income bracket, your changes in attainment have actually grown. You know, the change over time has actually grown from 1970 to 2012. We haven't made much of a dent in the change in attainment rate in the lower income quartile. Uh, you've seen the subsidized school lunch model. Uh, don't get too wrapped up in this. If you want to, I can get wrapped up in it after the fact. But this is pointing out that the um, the upper limits for each of the income quartiles is act they're actually moving apart. So the upper limit for the upper income quartile is going up. The upper limit for the lower income quartiles are actually going down. Meaning, in, we've heard a lot about um, <coughs> the decline of the middle class. Uh, we've heard a lot about income disparity of one percent in, in whatnot, whatever rhetoric you want to use. Uh, but this shows out that there is increasing disparity in terms of income backgrounds of our students. Um, full stop there, I think that point's made. Let me suggest this, that across this time, remember the graph to show the different uh, finance trends, so state finance has gone down, federal finances remain kind of flat, uh, individual share 
of that's families of students, the individual share has gone up. Um, I suggest to you that uh, however those, whatever the process was that drove those all ends, it's resulted in a situation that now forces colleges and universities to better justify why a family or a student would invest in the experience that they're engaging in at the university. So, if I cost a thousand dollars when my parents, if it costs a thousand dollars when my parents went to college, but it costs ten thousand dollars when I'm going to college, my parents might say, "Scott, you know what are you going to get out of that? You can, you can, you can earn enough money to pay for, uh, pay for the amount of money that you're having to borrow to, to, to pay for tuition." So it forces a question about return on investment from an individual level perspective. Earlier, I said when we talked about. Um, uh, space race, when we talked about the Cold War, uh, that those were investments from a nation building stance. Mm -hmm. And I'm suggesting to you that normally that's a good thing when we think about education. Uh, now I would contend that we're actually looking at education from more of a career building stance. And so when you move it from the public good to the individual good, which is what I suggest we've done, you change the terms of the debate entirely. Now we want to know about return on investment by degree area, and we should know these things, but these are, these are becoming the focus. If, I, if I'm spending $20,000 a year on education, by golly, I'm going to want to know a lot more about what I'm going to get out of it in terms of labor market returns than if I'm spending $2,000 a year, the psychology would go. Um, so we've moved from a nation-building stance to a career-building stance. Uh, we've also, when we were achieving some level of success uh, in post-secondary education, and even in K-12, the degree that we had it before, that the success was built on a much more homogeneous population than the one that we deal with now. This too is not news, but it's an important artifact in this, that the heterogeneity in our population in terms of racial backgrounds, religious backgrounds, income backgrounds, is greater than ever. And this is presenting challenges for teacher preparation, this is presenting challenges for the way we structure our schools. This is presenting challenges for language. Uh, this is presenting challenges on, on, on any number of fronts that we can explore uh, as we go forward. But we didn't experience this uh, before. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we experience in post-secondary education is that of remediation. And the cost of remediation to, to institutions that are enrolling large numbers of students from lower income backgrounds is much greater than the cost of remediation for institutions that choose to go another route and, and, and admit students who are from upper income backgrounds. Why? Because the quality of education in general in schools that serve lower income families is far lower than the quality of education in schools that serve upper income families. So as a result, again, I'm not telling you anything you know, I'm just establishing facts here. As I see them, you can challenge my facts if you wish. Um, as a result, uh, when students get to college, they're, not, they're far less likely to be prepared for college if you come from a lower income background than if you come from uh, a, a more affluent family. And this translates into uh, the cost the college will bear for ensuring that you are up to speed as you hit even your first year. It also affects your probability of success when you get to college. Because if you go through, I mean, there are all different ways to look at this, but if you go through uh, a semester of remedial courses, and um, you haven't earned a credit yet by your second semester, we know you're far less likely to continue your education than if you were engaged in, in, in some meaningful academic work uh, from the get-go. If you come from a lower income background, you're far less likely to engage in meaningful academic work at the college level immediately. And by extension, you're far less likely to, uh, to continue uh, your participation in post-secondary education. Um, I have, uh, this morning I was at uh, the Community Foundation, is that what it's called, Nate? And uh, let me see if I can. I can make this not blurry, we'll see. So, uh, I don't know how to make this not blurry, but what you have is you have this kid who's, and I'll have to read it to you because you can't read that up there. Uh, it says, could someone please help me with these? I'm late from, from math class. And the kid under his arm is carrying hunger, sickness, homelessness, peer pressure, teen pregnancy, and the question of does anybody care about me? Now, sure, every kid deals with some 
version of does anybody care about me, but not every kid deals with the pressures of homelessness, sickness, hunger uh, that more often occurs uh, in schools that serve low income kids. So we've got to find a way to deal with By the way, the Community Foundation and, and Say Yes to Buffalo effort, uh, I thought, is doing a, a, a great job in terms of uh, bringing collective impact research to bear on uh, improving educational opportunity. In, in the Buffalo area. I, I was quite impressed by, uh, by what's going on there. Um, I promised you uh, no statistics, but I thought we'd have a whiteboard. We don't have it, so I'm going to try something else here. That, uh, this is my hot. Now you get to see how shoddy. I've got to get this in focus just a second. Let's see what I can do here. I'm not going to get in focus. I should have tried this at home first, I guess. Okay, well, this is oh, maybe there's the focus. Maybe this will enable me to just to make something up. I'm going to make something up here. You can generally see the numbers. Um, I have uh, low, low, lowest income quartile, second, third, highest income quartile, okay? I have 100 students in, in each group right there. Mind exercise since you can't read anything on the board that I have behind me. Um, let's assume I have these things that are supposed to be bell shaped distributions. The ability is the same across all four quartiles. And if anybody would like to debate that, that's going to be a different talk, okay? I'm not going to take that one on today. Um, in quartile one, I have a uh, high school graduation rate of, I'm going to be generous here and say 50%. Quartile two, I have a high school graduation rate of 70%, quartile three, 80%, quartile four, 90%. Okay? Now, if I go across that row after I do that, I come up with, uh, of, I had 400 students, I come up with 290 students that I have lost from uh, the primary secondary sector in the transition to post-secondary. Okay, I've lost 110 students already. These numbers are available to you from the National Center for Education Statistics. I'm using the most conservative numbers that I'm, uh, I, I can come up with here. I'm thinking about that problem of, God, we can't find enough people to enroll, okay? So we're going to turn to India and China to, to, to do that. Um, all right, great. Then you saw from the chart earlier, uh, you saw the variance in college continuation rates. Then if I multiply what's left over by college continuation rates, I can't even read what I have there, I have to tell you. Um, the college continuation rate for the lowest uh, group was 53.5. Uh, uh, the two middle groups was around 63 and 66 percent, and the upper group was 0.824 for the highest quartile uh, families. And if I net out who goes to college after that, I come up with 200. So basically I've cut half of the people who were in high school out uh, by the time I get them to college. Now the idea that when you saw some of those lines about college continuation, um, that's based on who graduated the year before. My point here is that in these bottom income quartiles, we've lost half the group anyway, so any comparison is a, is a challenging comparison. Um, it would be inaccurate to think that all that's the same. Now, uh, I come up with the bottom rows are 27 out of 100, 46 out of 100, 53 out of 100, and 74 out of 100 to equal the 200 total, 200 that I net after the averages that I apply from NCES. Um, I have down here how much it costs me to enroll each group. I think, you know, I said remedial education costs a lot more, so the, the institutional cost of enrolling what's ever left over from this group is higher generally. It would decrease, and I would suggest that for the most advantaged students, our costs are actually higher too, because we're having to discount more, we're having to offer more amenities to compete for those students, so I don't know what the calculus is, is here, but as I did this, um, and as I was going to do it on the board in a much more legible form, uh, I thought, well, what if we just wanted a 50% rate, and I just wanted to equalize things, right? So I'm saying we're basically netting 50% of the people in post-secondary, 50% uh, of the students in K-12 were netting uh, in post-secondary, and we're having an enrollment crisis. That's where I started. Um, well, it turns out that if I make each of these 50, I come up to 200. So if I bring if I bring this up, the same I bring that down, and bring this down, the same I bring that up and equalized everything, I would still come up with the same, but I'd have an equitable, it would be a horrible situation, but I'd still have an equitable situation. The rhetorical question is, would that be any better than what we have now? 
I like the equity piece. Okay? Uh, but the 50% the in terms of the development of human capital, the development of a return to a nation building stance, I don't know. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll not kill your eyes with that anymore. Uh, and I'll come back to, uh, so what? Um, I just put this up there to not kill your eyes. Do I have to explain anything here? These are changes, and this is just showing the, the, the uh, deviation in, in family income over time. Um, what do we do? I get asked this question a lot. What do you do? First of all, I'm the dean of a school of education. This problem I'm explaining to you is my problem. I own this problem. You guys are citizens of a school of education, a college, a university. It's our problem. We own this problem. We are presumably responsible for what goes on in K-12 education. Yeah, there are a lot of constraints and conditions and context that we have to navigate. But we're the people who train teachers. We're the people who train administrators. We're the people who figure out what research questions to focus on and how to focus on those questions. I'm going to suggest to you that we own this problem. And the criticism that's directed at us, we deserve to some degree. That was an observation, I guess, not a what do we do about it. Um, one of the first things I'd do about it if I had total control about these things is I would uh, come up with some equitable funding scheme for K-12 education. So uh, we have uh, every state in the country has fought with, uh, not every state, most states, most progressive states have at least considered a weight and student formula approach. Okay, the kids in the lower income quartile, guess what guys, they cost a lot more to educate than the kids in the upper income quartile in terms of the provision of the skills that are necessary to compete for occupations and compete for college admissions. Right now, our funding formulas are exactly the opposite in most states. Okay? Kids that come from more advantaged backgrounds, guess what? On a per pupil basis, they receive more money. Maybe not directly from the state, but there are mechanisms all around that that, that, that overly compensate the already advantaged uh, with mo more funding for education. So first, I, I would uh, uh, achieve some level of equity and funding for K-12 education. I would enhance efforts around community building and collective action efforts. Um, the homogeneous versus heterogeneous worlds that we lived in and the, the, the homogeneous worlds in the 50s and 60s, a lot of that is because we excluded a lot of people from uh, K-12 and post-secondary education, but it created a homogeneous environment. The fact is we're dealing with a heterogeneous environment, and that environment comes with issues that our schools simply have not been built to deal with. So there are communities around the schools. Schools are community institutions. If we think about schools outside of the context of the community and the neighborhood, we're missing an important part of what enables the student to succeed. I would focus more on collective action and community impact. I would hold colleges of education accountable uh, for the work that we do. Uh, I would like to know where my graduates are. I would like to know what they're doing. I would like to know how they're performing. I would like to know that for my administrative graduates. I would like to know that for my academic graduates. And I would like to know that for every teaching candidate that came through my program. And I don't, and I'm embarrassed to say that to you. The um, criticism that we receive from uh, National Center for Teaching Quality, just to name one uh, group that seems to get our attention, Jack, that group of your attention occasionally. Uh, we just ignore it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we strategically ignore, okay. I would love to have an answer for them, okay? And I don't. You know what? One of their top complaints is you guys need to be more selective. And I think, how on earth can we be more selective? Like, nobody, you know, it, we, we have. Blame the teacher for everything that we, not us. Broadly, societally, we blame the teacher for everything that's wrong with schools, and now we're going to try to convince some, we're going to try to get more exceptional academic candidates to participate in our programs. This is an issue that we have to deal with somehow, but we need to be held accountable for that. Um, and we need to capitalize uh, on that responsibility uh, in ways that, that, that give us legitimacy. Part of that is, I would suggest, we need to take back our problems. We are experts in education and educational processes. Last I checked, not many of us have been to Capitol Hill. Okay? Who's representing us in the debates about teacher preparation, in the debates about school funding, in the debates about value added? Well, I was all part of that, okay? The economists and the public policy people are. They are not experts in education. They are experts in economics, and they are experts in public policy, but not in what it takes to educate a child and a young adult, or even if somebody who's coming back for training. We, those are our questions. We certainly use their perspectives. 
their disciplinary expertise is invaluable for what we do, but we should not cede our questions intellectually to people in the disciplines. We're an applied field. We should capitalize on the disciplinary work that goes on around our field, but we should use that to better inform the smartest questions that we can be a part of. Um, finally, not finally, I'll stop because I'll get 45 minutes. Um, from the university level, I would like to see our presidents get involved with this. I would like to see our presidents stand up, and until they do, I don't think that we're going to really deal with the college of what did the library call it? The, uh, the, college, the, the College of Education problem? Here are a great book on, on why colleges of education is sort of the underdog on every campus. Um, but until presidents stand up and say, darn it, um, this is a societal problem. We are a societal institution. The well-being of K-12 education directly informs the well-being of post-secondary education. It's not going to happen. But the good news is I think that we're beginning to see college presidents get this. And if it starts at the beginning where I did with, oh my God, we're not going to make our enrollments, so we're going to have to let staff go. We're not going to hire those faculty we wanted to hire. We're not going to give those students the fellowships that they, that they deserve. Um, if that's what gets their attention, fine. At least we've got their attention. At least we can begin to treat this problem holistically and expertly. Thank you for your time.